our today's speaker. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, very good. So, for the record, I need to say who who I am. I am the. My name is Alexander Lukin, and I'm the head of Department of International Relations and International Laboratory of World Order Studies and the New Regionalism of our University High School of Economics. And we are holding the third session of Eurasian online seminar. Our speaker today is uh, Professor Mark Beeson, is a world-renowned expert on the Asia-Pacific regionalism. And he will speak today on the rise of the Indo-Pacific strategic competition in Australia's region. Ma Professor Beeson is Professor of International Politics at the University of Western Australia. And before rejoining, before, because he worked there before, the University of Western Australia, he taught at a number of universities, Murdoch, Griffith, Queensland, universities in Australia, and universities of York and Birmingham in the United Kingdom. His work is centered on the politics, economics, and security of the broadly conceived Asia-Pacific region. Uh, he is the author of more than 200 journal articles and book chapters, co-editor of Contemporary Politics, uh, which is a journal, and the founding editor of the Pelgrave series, Critical Studies of the Asia-Pacific. Recent books in his recent books include and and books and also edited volumes. Well, if I read the only the titles of all of them, it will take like one hour. But so only recent of them include China's regional relations, evolving foreign policy dynamics. It's an edited volume. Also, regionalism and globalization in East Asia, rivalry and cooperation in the Asia Pacific. Uh, Rethinking Global Governments, and uh, his book, uh, which is the latest and very interesting, uh, the title is Environmental Populism, The Politics of Survival of the Ethno Percent. So, uh, usually the speaker, well, we, we do it the usual traditional way, Usually the speaker speaks for like 40 minutes to one hour. And then if he is not tired, he probably will take a few questions. Well, Professor Bisson, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Alexander. And thanks for the kind words and introduction. Can you all hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, that's good. That's good. That's a good start. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, the rise of the Indo-Pacific and I hope I've got a little uh, PowerPoint that I can share with you. Let me just see if this technology all works. So I'm hoping that uh, you can see the PowerPoint on the full screen and there's a little panel on the side with me and a few other people. Is that okay? It works fine. Okay, that's good. Okay, so I'm delighted to have this opportunity to uh, talk to you all and I'm looking forward to your responses to this. And uh, I should say that uh, and as the title suggests, Australia is going to fin uh, feature uh, quite prominently in the following discussion, which you might find slightly surprising. But uh, I'm going to suggest to you that uh, in the, when we're thinking about the rise of the Indo-Pacific, Australia has played a surprisingly prominent role. So uh, and for reasons I'll explain. So let me just give you an idea if the technology works, if I can advance the page. So this is what I'm going to try and talk about uh, over the next few minutes. I don't know if I can adjust that a bit. Can I? Yes, I can. That's good. <coughs> okay. So um, the big thing that's happened in Australia and arguably in the region is that Australian policymakers used to talk about the Asia Pacific. That was the way that we understood uh, a large part of the Southern Hemisphere for many years. And it seemed to make quite a lot of sense uh, for quite a long time. But recently, for a variety of reasons that I'll uh, explain as we go along, uh, Australian policymakers in particular, 
uh, and also policymakers from Japan have become increasingly interested in this idea of the so-called Indo-Pacific as an alternative way of thinking about uh, what the region is composed of, where its borders are, and who's in and who's out. And uh, so for an, from an Australian perspective, as I'll suggest, this kind of formulation makes a good deal of sense. Uh, and for other countries, most notably uh, China, they're less enthusiastic about it for reasons that I'll explain. Uh, and I think the main reason that uh, China isn't terribly keen on the idea is because for a lot of people who advocate the idea of the so-called Indo-Pacific, I think it's seen essentially as a way of trying to respond to or even contain or possibly balance against the rise of China. I think that's the underlying rationale for this way of thinking about the region. And it, in those circumstances, it's really not that surprising that the Chinese might not be that thrilled about uh, this new formulation. So let me just develop that argument and, uh, and try and give you some perspective. Oh, wrong one, just a second. Uh, okay, so a little map to start off with, which I hope you can see. Uh, I don't know if I can, no, I can't move that over, I don't think. But anyway, the, the major reason for Australia thinking differently about the, uh, the region and what's going on there is because from its outset as an independent country, which wasn't that long ago, and uh, formally it was the beginning of the 20th century, informally Australia didn't really take responsibility for its own foreign policy until the middle of the 20th century during the Second World War, when it really had no other choice. Until then it relied on uh, what our former Prime Minister Robert Menzies described as great and powerful friends. And by this he meant that the assumption was in Australia that Australia is a not very powerful country. It's a long way from its kind of natural friends and allies in Europe or North America. Therefore, it needed to cultivate relationships, strategic relationships with these more powerful countries. Initially, it was the United Kingdom because that was the country that colonized Australia. And since the Second World War, it's been the United States. And there's been a formal alliance relationship between Australia and the United States ever since the Second World War and that is still the basis of our strategic posture uh, and it's something that most policymakers in this country can imagine no other circumstances than supporting the United States come what may or who runs the United States for that matter as well and that's something I'll say a little bit more about as I go along as well if I can get this thing to go. So before I do, let me just say something about the, what I've described here as the rise and fall of the Asia Pacific. Because as I mentioned, for a long time, the only way it seemed of thinking about uh, the region of which Australia is a part and much of what we now think of as the Indo-Pacific or East Asia, depending on how you want to describe these things, for a long time, the only way of describing uh, the region was as the quote-unquote Asia-Pacific. Now, from an Australian point, point of view, again, it made a good deal of sense because over the last 30 or 40 years or so, Australia's trade relationship has completely changed and Northeast Asia is simply much more important to Australia economically uh, than any other part of the world. Uh, and that change happened in the kind of, I think it was the mid 1970s when Japan became Australia's number one trade partner. Now, of course, it's China, but Northeast Asia generally has been absolutely vital for Australia economically. Now, a lot of policymakers in Australia weren't terribly happy about this because uh, they're not countries with whom we're familiar, used to doing business, uh, and frankly, didn't understand for a long time. And Plenty of people in this country, <coughs> excuse me, still don't understand the region. However, there was, a, there, there was and there is a fundamental tension as far as Australia is concerned, and also, uh, I might add, increasingly, all of the other countries of East Asia now. For every country in, us, in East Asia and for Australia, China is the number one trade partner some of the country, that includes Japan as well, some of the countries in East Asia aren't that happy about the idea uh, that 
China's the number one trade partner. And I don't think Australian policymakers, if they could freely choose who's going to be our number one trade partner in the world, I don't think China will be top of the list. So it's an uncomfortable uh, geoeconomic reality, if you like, and one that's fundamentally uh, in tension with the uh, strategic alliance with the United States. This is the ANZUS Agreement, which stands for Australia, New Zealand, uh, United States Security Agreement. Interestingly, uh, New Zealand is no longer a part of that because of uh, their refusal to allow nuclear powered and nuclear armed uh, American vessels to enter New Zealand waters, but, uh, but, the, but Australia definitely is. And the alliance remains the foundation stone of Australian foreign policy and security policy. So what happened to the Asia Pacific idea? Why, why did that seem to not do the job or provide the kind of understanding that people originally expected that it would do so? I think the main reason, and if you know anything about it, well, you do know something about APEC, the Russian viewers do, of course, because uh, you're in APEC. And in, interestingly, some people think that allowing, and don't take this the wrong way, please, Russian viewers, but, uh, but some people think that allowing Russia into APEC was one of the things that fundamentally undermined it because it meant that the grouping, that is the Asia Pacific grouping, was so big and included so many different countries uh, for not obvious reasons that it really didn't uh, pass the test of credibility. Yeah, as, a, as a really meaningful kind of uh, grouping. So there were too many members, too many different divergent uh, viewpoints, too many ideas about what this grouping uh, should represent. And that's one of the reasons why uh, the grouping or the, uh, the APEC grouping has found it difficult to make progress and why the, the idea of the Asia Pacific as a way of thinking about the region has, has largely fallen out of favor, certainly in this country, and as I'll suggest to you later on, also in the United States now as well, which is pretty interesting. This is a little map of the region. Uh, this is the, what we might call the Indo-Pacific region or perhaps East Asia plus Australia, depending on how you want to, dis to describe these things. But this is uh, the region uh, as seen uh, from uh, Beijing in some ways. And if, you, if you're a policymaker sitting in Beijing, you can, you can understand why they might feel a bit hemmed in uh, and a bit constrained by uh, the outposts of uh, American military power and the number of allies that the United States still has, uh, despite the uh, Trump administration, still has in the region. Even before Trump arrived, though, uh, Barack Obama uh, came under a lot of pressure domestically and from his allies that he should take the what was then the Asia Pacific region more seriously. Uh, and that was driven, I think, almost entirely by the recognition or the, indeed the fear that the rise of China was undermining American power in the region and that America really needed to do something to respond to uh, the rise of China. So Obama came up with this idea of the so-called pivot, uh, which meant a kind of rebalancing of American forces uh, towards the Asia Pacific region and away from the Middle East because the assumption was that by this time that in the Obama administration all of the problems with the Middle East would have been sorted out and uh, they could concentrate on the Asia Pacific. Now as we know that didn't work out too well because there are still terrible problems in the Middle East that even Mr. Trump has to think about and wrestle with and hasn't been able to resolve despite the best efforts of Jared Kushner, who would have thought that he couldn't sort things out, but there you are, that's another story perhaps. And I perhaps shouldn't be flippant about these things, but, uh, but anyway, in Australia, when the, when the pivot happened, uh, there was little public policy debate about uh, what Australia's re response should be. And Australian policymakers uh, just took it for granted that they would support uh, the American shift in priorities and from the, the perspective of many strategic analysts in Australia, uh, the idea that the Americans are going to take this region more seriously than they had done was considered to be a good thing and generally uh, welcome. As I say that, uh, earlier, from the perspective of Beijing, however, uh, this 
shift in American priorities and the kind of support that it received from allies like Australia reinforced, Ch reinforced Chinese concerns about the possibilities of a kind of new era of containment. Nobody ever used that word in Australia or much in America for that matter, but I think you can understand why uh, policymakers and strategic analysts in China might feel that they were being constrained by these kinds of new policy shifts uh, and that this was something that they would be uh, concerned about. Now, we all know that Mr. Trump is now running the United States for better or worse. And the key uh, idea I think that's emerged from the Trump presidency is on the one hand, it's all about America first and putting American national interest first. And whatever you think about Trump, I don't think he's uh, famous for his support of multilateralism. Uh, I don't think he thinks much of the way that American foreign policy was conducted in the past. And he thinks that many of America's allies have actually taken advantage of uh, America's uh, generosity in underpinning the strategic order of the Asia Pacific. So he's very transactional uh, and he thinks that America has been getting a bad deal basically. So before I say anything more about, about Mr. Trump, let me just say a few words about this idea of the Indo-Pacific, which in some ways has been around for quite a long time as a geographical idea, but nobody took it terribly seriously. Nobody really invoked it uh, as a kind of regional identity in the way that they had done uh, with this idea of the Asia Pacific, which has now uh, disappeared almost. Interestingly, the one country that did uh, express uh, a good deal of interest was Japan, uh, particularly under Shinzo Abe. He's been a prominent champion of this idea and arguably he's done more to uh, promote this new way of thinking about the region uh, than just about anybody else. Uh, from an Australian perspective, they were a, a little bit slower than Japan to see the possible advantages of this from a kind of narrow strategic point of view at least. From an Australian po point of view, though, if just looking at the map, you can see why it might appeal to Australian policymakers, because Australia is right at the centre of this uh, potential region. And where I'm sitting tonight in Perth, which is on the left hand side of Australia, as you look at it, that's exactly in the middle of this uh, new uh, region. So people in Australia, in Western Australia, where I live and I'm speaking from, are very excited about this a uh, new way of thinking about the region. And it's no coincidence, I think, that three of the last four foreign ministers in Australia have all come from Western Australia and have all been powerful supporters of thinking about this new uh, regional identity and way of uh, reconfiguring uh, Australia's place in the region and indeed the region itself. But I think for all of those uh, past foreign ministers and for most of the strategic community, in Australia at the moment. There's no doubt, I don't think, that they think that this new regional uh, identity, if they can convert it into something more substantial, and if other countries buy into it, then it offers a new way of thinking about uh, and responding to the rise of China. And I think, for what it's worth, that the rise of China is maybe the biggest thing in the world in the last couple of hundred years, and maybe the biggest thing ever, but it's certainly going to be a big influence on the 21st century and the part of the world of which uh, Australia is a part. Now, the big question, I think, is will the Indo-Pacific idea go the same way that the Asia-Pacific idea went because it became uh, too uh, big to, uh, to accommodate the kind of uh, conflicting interests that were embedded in it, and it wasn't possible to institutionalize it effectively in a way that would allow it to actually do things uh, and to actually influence the behavior of the member states uh, that were a part of it. So that's the big challenge for the Indo-Pacific, even for its admirers, I think. Uh, I'm not sure, you might be losing part of the map here, but basically this is uh, just a map of the Indo-Pacific sea lanes. And as you can see, for strategic analysts, uh, it, the, the sea lanes here are really important because they transverse uh, the Indian Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, and those famous choke points 
uh, around the Straits of Malacca. Uh, and so it's a vitally important uh, uh, route for supplies of energy from the Middle East to Asia, amongst other things. And so it's always had uh, a potentially really important strategic role. And I think the Indo-Pacific idea is one way of uh, highlighting uh, its potential uh, significance. So at one level, I think there's no doubt that the Indo-Pacific does capture something interesting and important uh, about the possible uh, geographical nature of the region, but it faces this same challenge of, does it have an identity? Uh, does it have a particular purpose other than this kind of uh, unspoken implicit idea about containing China? Uh, can it really uh, be a mechanism around which people can really uh, organize themselves and, and buy into effectively. And some people have argued that even for the United States, uh, the Indo-Pacific idea is literally a, a big stretch in the sense that it encompasses not just the entire Pacific Ocean, but the Indian Ocean as well. And some people argue there are limits to what the United States can do uh, in terms of uh, it extending its power projection and influencing events a long way from its own shores. So there are some capacity constraints perhaps uh, on the United States uh, and uh, it's not at all obvious uh, whose ideas or what kind of values are going to be uh, influential in this particular formulation even if they can find a real institutional identity around which uh, members of the Indo-Pacific can actually coalesce. And that's a, that's a kind of work in progress, I think. So the United States, interestingly, and Mr. Trump in particular, have recently bought into this uh, Indo-Pacific idea. And in Australia, of course, everybody was delighted. Well, the strategic analysts in Canberra, at least, were delighted by this outcome because it's exactly what they've been trying to encourage the Americans to do to buy into this new idea of the Indo-Pacific uh, as a way of organizing strategic thinking uh, and the deployment of American forces uh, in the region. So that's the good news. Uh, there's still a big question mark about how seriously uh, Trump takes this idea or any other idea for that matter. But uh, given America's transactional approach to foreign policy under Mr. Trump, uh, it's an open question about what he would expect in exchange for uh, American support of this kind of Indo-Pacific idea, and whether he would be prepared to commit the kind of resources and effort uh, to actually make this uh, a reality. But the rhetoric is uh, very agreeable as far as uh, Australian policy makers are concerned. And this idea of the free and open Indo-Pacific has become the kind of catchphrase that people are using now as the kind of rationale and indeed a justification and a legitimation for this kind of new way of thinking about the region and its potential uh, in the future. Just keep this going. Now, this is uh, another way of thinking about the uh, Indo-Pacific idea. And this is the kind of, uh, this map is uh, a representation of the original idea that uh, Shinzo Abe floated when he was thinking about uh, talking about this kind of Indo-Pacific idea. Uh, and he talked about the so-called security diamond. And the members of the security diamond were uh, Japan themselves, of course, Australia, uh, and the United States, and India. Now, Japan, the United States, and Australia all have uh, formal alliance relationships amongst each other. Uh, and so it kind of made sense. And there was something to work with uh, from a strategic perspective already. And this potential grouping that includes India as well has been rechristened as the quad states, the quadrilateral dialogue between those four states. The big question is, uh, what's the purpose of the quadrilateral dialogue? Uh, other than as a way of containing China. And if it's not a way of contain containing China, why hasn't the most important, powerful country in the uh, immediate Indo-Pacific region 
actually been invited to join? Uh, and I think it's a question many people in Beijing might be asking themselves. And I think it's uh, quite evident uh, that that's the most substantial uh, formal uh, manifestation of the Indo-Pacific identity. And it's been one that revolves almost exclusively around uh, strategic questions rather than uh, anything else. Now, at this stage, uh, there are very real questions about how uh, seriously India is going to take this new quadrilateral dialogue arrangement. And some people think, given that there hasn't been a lot of progress, if that's the word, on developing the quad relationship between all four countries at once, uh, some people are pointing to the fact that bilateral treaties and arrangements are becoming more important between the members of the Quad, and maybe that will give the whole thing uh, more substance in the future. So we'll have to have to wait and see how that uh, works out. So the big question I think is, given the erratic, unpredictable nature of the Trump administration, uh, can any version of formal, institutionalized cooperation survive the Trump administration? And there was a long article in the uh, New York Times today talking about the shock and surprise of countries around the world at the absence of American leadership. And I thought that the shocking and surprising thing was that anybody was shocked and surprised after three, three years of the Trump administration about the fact that American leadership is now in more doubt, more uncertain than it's possibly been for the last 50 or 60 years or so. And I think arguably, you know, Trump is the least able or least qualified uh, president in certainly recent American history. And I think there's a, a major failing in his recognition of just how valuable uh, some of the kind of institutional order that the Americans created uh, in the period after the Second World War, which uh, we might add led to the demise of the Soviet Union in part, no doubt. And that's a pretty big geopolitical outcome, but it's precisely the sort of thing that Donald Trump seems to be incapable of recognizing uh, what a benefit uh, American hegemony in an institutionalized form and the kind of allied uh, relationships he had with various countries around the world. He didn't seem, doesn't really, still doesn't seem to recognize how advantageous that is, actually is for the United States of America because no other country has a set of relationships like that anywhere in the world. However, it seems that Trump is prepared to uh, make deals and to sacrifice even close friends and to undermine the credibility of close institutional, institutionalized allies like NATO, uh, for example. So uh, anybody who's expecting uh, the Indo-Pacific idea to uh, progress in a different kind of way, I think really needs to have a, uh, a careful think about what the track record under Trump looks like and what the possibilities are for him really being a reliable uh, ally in the future. And that kind of debate has hardly had any influence or significance in Australia. But I think there are other countries, certainly in some of the Europeans now, are very uh, concerned about the credibility and reliability of the United States. And I think much of this is down to uh, the presidency of Donald Trump, and I think his commitment to the Indo-Pacific is up in the air at best, and we'll have to see what happens, I think, as a consequence of that. Now, what this has done, potentially, of course, this absence of American leadership uh, has opened the door uh, for other countries to try to assert themselves, and even before this recent uh, pandemic that seems to be overturning the international system uh, before our eyes. Even before recent events, it was clear that the rise of China, amongst other things, I mean, perhaps it's made, uh, it represents a kind of traditional strategic threat of a sort that strategic analysts get pretty worked up about, but it also clearly represented in this part of the world, that's East Asia, the Indo-Pacific, whatever you want to call it, it represented a uh, fundamental shift in the balance of geoeconomic power. And it's no coincidence that we're all talking about geoeconomics these days, because there's been a, a recognition 
that China has serious geoeconomic influence, not least in the East Asia region, where, as I mentioned before, I think every single country in the East Asian region, China is their number one trade partner. And whether they like China or not, and plenty, plenty of them don't, I don't think, and I'm nervous about it, but whether they like China or not, they have to have a good working relationship with China because it's simply so important uh, economically. And even people like Duterte, who's pictured in this photo shaking hands with Xi Jinping, Duterte, who was the president of the Philippines, when he first came to office, said he was going to stand up to China, uh, stop them pushing, throwing their weight around in the South China Sea. Uh, since he's been in office, uh, he's gone quite literally almost cap in hand to Beijing uh, to try and ingratiate himself with Xi Jinping because he thinks uh, that the Chinese will invest in the Philippines, maybe build them a high-speed railway, do other things for them, uh, and he's changed his tune uh, and uh, also uh, cast doubt about the strategic relationship with the United States in the process, largely because of uh, China's geoeconomic influence. So, so the big question in this part of the world is even if the uh, states of Southeast Asia and uh, elsewhere uh, are not that happy about China's growing power and influence, are they really uh, in a position to resist. Uh, we Are we beginning to see the, the emergence of a uh, Japanese, sphere, sorry, a Chinese sphere of influence uh, in the East Asian region, uh, or even the re-emergence of a kind of new tributary system in which China is acknowledged as the dominant power in the region, uh, and perhaps one in which, uh, at some stage, America has to make a tough decision about whether they stay and oppose the seemingly inexorable rise of China? Or do they think it's actually worth risking a direct conflict uh, with China to contain it uh, and to maintain American influence? I think that's one of the big questions uh, in the background about all of these kinds of debates. The other point that's worth making about if we do see uh, a kind of new hegemonic uh, or sphere of influence Chinese sphere of influence in uh, East Asia, would it be any worse uh, than what's gone before? Because I mean, it's worth remembering that America has been involved uh, in a couple of big wars in East Asia, and the last one was the Vietnam War, which was another colossal misjudgment, arguably, on the part of the United States, uh, which inflicted serious damage uh, on the region. China frequently makes the point that they haven't invaded anybody uh, historically, uh, and that by comparison, their record doesn't look too bad. And uh, the American scholar David Kang has written uh, influentially, uh, in some circles at least, that when you do a comparison of Chinese and American hegemony, when Chinese has been strong in East Asia, uh, the region has actually been more stable when China's been weak. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, just from a kind of comparative perspective, I think. So this is my last slide. You'll be delighted to hear, no doubt. But uh, just a few tentative conclusions, and I'm happy to talk about all of the above and uh, be interested to hear your comments and uh, suggestions. Uh, so the point about the uh, Indo-Pacific is a lot of this hinges on what India will do, because India's potentially the other great rising power of the region. But there's a kind of assumption uh, amongst the, certainly some of the policymakers in Australia and the United States that India is probably going to go along with this because that's the sort of thing that might be in their interest. But that's far from clear. India is capable of having its own independent foreign policy and its own kind of relationship with China. So it's not at all clear that India will make the judgment that it's in their interests to make this kind of symbolic commitment and possibly a more tangible commitment to being an active member of the quadrilateral dialogue, if it seems as if that's primarily about just containing uh, China. The other question is, can any regional grouping that you might care to mention, can it really hope to succeed if it doesn't include China, given that China is the principal power in the region now, economically and strategically, uh, is it really feasible to have a grouping that locks China out and seems to be directed uh, toward doing not much else other than trying to contain uh, 
or deter China. So that may not be the best basis for amicable relations in the region uh, either. And I made the point about, is the Quad just going to reproduce uh, the sorts of Cold War tensions that dominated this part of the world? And one of the points to make in passing is that one of the other reasons why groupings like the Asia Pacific uh, Economic Cooperation Forum uh, were not possible uh, before the end of the Cold War is because this part of the world, the Asia Pacific, the Indo Pacific, whatever you want to call it, was hopelessly divided by the divisions of the Cold War. And the big question is is the Quad simply going to reproduce those kinds of same divisions between some of the major players in the region that existed uh, during the Cold War years? So that's a kind of an interesting question. Uh, what are the Indo Pacific? Ex states actually expect China to do in response to the creation of the Indo-Pacific uh, generally and the quadrilateral dialogue in particular. If I was making policy in Beijing, I don't think I'd be too enthusiastic or pleased, and I would feel maybe the need to try and be more assertive rather than less. Uh, and this takes on particular significance because I'm sure you're all aware of this famous book uh, and articles written by Graham Allison in the States who's talked about the, what he sees as the increasing likelihood of the so-called uh, Thucydides trap. This idea that a rising power, i.e. China, and a declining power, which I think we can say in relative terms at least the United States is, when you get a rising power and a declining power, conflict, uh, Allison argues, is almost inevitable as the rising power will seek to impose its views uh, its ideas, its uh, idea of where it should be in its own region. Uh, and so for people like Alison and other people, uh, they think that the, there was already uh, a degree of ten rising tension in the region uh, and that things like the Indo-Pacific idea and the Quad in particular may exacerbate rather than uh, address those kinds of tensions. So. Anyway, hopefully I've given you a bit of something to think about. I'm sure you'll all have things you want to disagree and argue about, but, but anyway, I look, I look forward to your comments and uh, questions either way. Uh, Professor Karaganov, can I answer my question? Well, uh, I, I, I would say that, no, Professor Kanaev, of course, can ask a question, but could you please, uh, other people, could you write to the chat, please? So that in that case, I see the order of who wants to ask the questions, and then I give you, I give you the chance. And now, Professor Kanaev, uh, by by the way, I wanted to tell you that we study in the Pacific here, and Professor Kanaev is one of the experts on the in the Pacific, one of the best in our university in Russia. So. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Alexander Vladimirovich. Uh, thank you very much indeed. And uh, before my question, I want to make some preliminary remarks which are important. At the High School of Economics, we follow very closely the key processes associated with the Asia-Pacific region and since recently the Indo-Pacific region. And also we trace the present-day discussions within the Australian expert community. And I would outline five main directions. The first direction is presented, uh, well, uh, focuses upon a very simple question. To what extent can the Indo-Pacific region be a consolidating rather than a dividing? Uh, well, uh, shall I continue? Uh, Mark uh, uh, has left us. It's grabbing the pen. Okay, and the first narrative concentrates upon the following question. To what extent can the Indo-Pacific region be a consolidating agenda in the Australia-US relationship? And here I would uh, refer to uh, an article written by Rod Lyon, and uh, this article was published at the Strategist website, which says the following. Uh, in the Indo-Pacific region, it's impossible to synergize the Asian economic growth and the American alliances. And uh, uh, the Indo-Pacific region as an international project project is unlikely to be a success story. The second point uh, goes to 
uh, the role of China. And uh, uh, Australian experts exemplified, for example, by Paul Deep, a well-known figure in uh, Australian export, export, uh, export community, uh, raises uh, the following question. In case China flexes its military muscles in the South China Sea, how should uh, linking it with the Indo-Pacific narrative as a uh, counter-offensive to the Indo-Pacific narrative, how should Australia react? And his conclusion is, uh, um, again, very simple. We should uh, find uh, friends, but uh, our foundation uh, uh, should be uh, well, uh, based upon our common problems uh, uh, as uh, opposed to uh, China's policy. In case we all have some problems in our relations with China, this can be a consolidating uh, agenda in our joint response. The third point relates to India, and uh, here Peter Varghese, another prominent figure in Australian export community, says that it's necessary to invite India to the Asia-Pacific region, because in the Indo-Pacific region, no American alliances and uh, processes and projects of economic regionalism exist, so it's expedient to invite India to participate in the Asia-Pacific projects, multilateral dialogue, uh, uh, etc. Then, uh, um, Alan Gingell, uh, another uh, well-known figure in the Australian export community, raises the question of the survivability of the Indo the Pacific region in the present uh, coronavirus pandemics. And he says that the agenda of the free and open, uh, free and open in the Pacific region runs counter to the present day realities. Uh, 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 he mentions uh, both protectionism and uh, nationalism and restrictionism, and the idea itself might well fade away. And my question to you is very simple. Um, uh, is it uh, expedient to expect a kind of minilateral cooperation, for example, uh, trilateral, quadrilateral cooperation, like, for example, uh, four-party patrolling of the Straits of Malacca, instead of fussing about this large-scale geopolitical project uh, that embraces the Pacific Ocean and the Indian Ocean? And finally, let me express my heartfelt gratitude for your presentation because I personally have been able to expand my knowledge on this particular subject. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay, well, quite comprehensive set of questions there. Now let me see if I can work my way through them. So, uh, okay, so the, the question about the synergy between uh, economic uh, and strategic relations, this is the absolutely fundamental problem that everybody's trying to wrestle with in the region and uh, particularly Australia. And I don't know if you've been following the last couple of days, but uh, Maurice Payne, our foreign minister, has made a couple of high profile interventions saying we should, well, we're supporting the freedom of navigation uh, patrols that are meant to counter China. Now, my position on this for what it's worth is I'm a big fan of the idea that Australia should have a more independent foreign policy, be less uh, reflexively supportive of the United States whatever they do, because sometimes the, Ameri the United States makes some disastrous decisions, uh, and it, the, the conflict in Iraq being the most spectacular one. So, so I don't think it's in Australia's interest to always uh, immediately follow, uh, or even to get ahead of the Amer what the Americans are saying in some cases, particularly when Australia, uh, uh, China's our biggest trade partner. Now that doesn't mean to say that we can never stand up for our values or have an opinion on things, but I just don't see the, the value in being so prominent, so outspoken, so ahead of the curve in trying to respond to some of these kinds of issues. I'm not sure what good that really does when Australia cannot actually influence the outcome of any of these things on its own. It's always going to be uh, one of the supporting cast rather than the, the kind of lead players in these kinds of events. So I think there's a question about that and about the the, the most appropriate or useful way of trying to uh, calibrate foreign policy for a middle power like Australia with relatively limited uh, abilities. And that goes to this, that answers the second question, I think, in some ways about the what to do about China and the South China Sea and how we should respond now. Clearly, it's not in anybody's interest, I don't think, if China takes over the entire, entire South China Sea uh, and it becomes uh, 
uh, a no-go area for the rest of the world, but quite how you respond to them, uh, what the best way of trying to discourage China from doing that is, is a kind of an open question. Uh, if there was more predictable, uh, unambiguously useful leadership from the United States in a coherent and uh, continuing manner, then maybe we could have more confidence in about the role that we could play. But when there isn't, uh, we, I'm sure you've read Hugh White's book about uh, Australia alone and the idea that the Americans might actually decide, particularly under Trump, just to pack up and go home. And then we would be left with China. And if we've upset them and uh, they hate us because we've been saying nasty things about them all this time, that might not be a good look for our future relations in the region. So there are those kind of calculations to make as well. This point about India and the Asia Pacific, uh, I'm not kind of sure uh, how that works. I mean, I know the Americans have a uh, an idea that they can persuade India to be supportive and be one of their friends and possibly an ally in the future and all of those kinds of things. But whether that's actually going to happen, I mean, I think part of it is uh, there's a degree of wishful thinking on the part of Australian policymakers that this would be a great outcome as far as we're concerned. India stepping up, doing its bit, being supportive of our key ally, taking a more uh, high profile position. That would be great as far as we're concerned. Whether they're actually going to do that, whether it's in their interest to do so, I think is far from clear at this stage. And I'm not an India expert, and maybe other people listening in can offer a more informed view. But I mean, I think India's got ideas about their own place in the world and what they should do. So, so I'm not too, too sure about that. But, uh, but the, the uh, Alan Gingell is a colleague of mine in the Australian Institute of International Affairs, and he's very well worth listening to, if, and he's got a great podcast series uh, via the Institute of International Affairs, if anybody's interested. But, uh, but he's a smart guy, and uh, his points about the the vulnerability of the free and open Indo-Pacific to conventional strategic shocks is not unreasonable. But the, what's happening at the moment with the coronavirus and the upending of many of the uh, apparent certainties that everybody took for granted until a couple of weeks ago, uh, not the least of which is the, the vulnerability of uh, global production chains, uh, many of which are now centered on China. And this has exposed the vulnerability of countries like uh, the United States. Uh, it's certainly exposed Australia's vulnerability to external economic uh, and strategic events over which they have no control. So I think we're going to, it's very likely that we'll see uh, a resurgence of economic nationalism, uh, and the championing of industry, industry policies uh, around the region in a way that we haven't seen uh, for 30 or 40 years possibly. So that could be uh, an important uh, long-term structural development and the, the certainty about globalization and the free and open Indo-Pacific, they're much less uh, certain than they were a few weeks ago, I think. Let me see, Ash Jones wants to ask a question. Go ahead, please. Hello. Uh, yeah, hello. Um, yeah, I just put the question in the chat. Um, I'm just wondering, can you expand on what you meant by Cold War style tensions? Because we're also economically integrated now, as you just mentioned in supply chains. So that's, that's very unlike the Cold War. I'm also curious about um, what Vietnam thinks of the Quad, and also how would Cold War patterns of thinking, if they returned, how would they play out in domestic politics? Domestic politics. Okay. Uh, good to see you, Ash. All good questions. Uh, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to answer the last one off the top of my head, but, uh, but the point about the, the Cold War and... Uh, the liberal international economic order is a really good and important one because uh, there's a big kind of theoretical debate which we probably don't want to get into in a, in a venue like this, in a, a seminar like this. But liberals, of whom there are many in America still, uh, and very prominent ones too, have always argued that one of the big benefits of a liberal international economic order, globalization, if you will, is that it changes the calculus of uh, policymakers thinking. They recognize, the argument goes, uh, 
uh, if they're rational, that they've got too much to lose by jeopardizing an international economic system from which they have been historically some of the principal beneficiaries. And I think the whole rise of China, in my view, cannot be understood without thinking about the hegemonic institutionalized uh, economic order that the United States ha helped to develop and build during the Cold War era. So paradoxically, uh, those kind of geopolitical forces and factors can be forces for uh, economic development and integration under, cer under certain circumstances. But as all of the uh, Russian viewers of this would remember all too well, uh, the world was divided and some parts of the world weren't integrated into that uh, global framework. And there's a pretty good argument for saying that's one of the reasons that the Soviet Union found it difficult to compete uh, with the United States because they didn't benefit from the same forms of economic integration and dynamism uh, that some of the capitalist economies did. So that's one kind of argument about that. But the central one about liberal economic interdependence is a really important and good one. And if we retreat to forms of economic uh, and other forms of nationalism, which the Trump administration is always, is actually dis, uh, demonstrating that they've got an appetite for already, then I think that would be a very retrograde step. And ultimately, if the liberal economic order does break down in a serious kind of way, we've got a pretty good uh, and pretty sobering uh, economic lesson from the 1930s about what the world looks like when that happens and the kind of politics uh, that can come out of those kind of economic catastrophes. So the stakes are pretty high for these kinds of things. And I think thinking about the domestic politics, unfortunately, the United States might be kind of paving the way in some ways on, in this regard because the sophistication of the economic debate in Australia, in, well, in Australia too probably, but in America, uh, is not great amongst the ordinary population, I think. And this sort of ranting about it's all China's fault, America first, blah, blah, blah. There's a substantial section of the American electorate that thinks this is a pretty reasonable way of responding to the circumstances they find themselves in. And Trump has also demonstrated that he's a populist and he's quite happy to deflect the blame onto everybody else, uh, given the chance. So I think that domestic uh, spin-off from uh, an increasingly polarized, decoupled global economy could be one of the unfortunate uh, consequences of this. I don't know enough about Vietnam uh, to really comment about their attitude towards the Quad, but I know somebody at our university who does, Ash, and I'll introduce you to them. Right. Thank you. I have uh, Sergei Trush, uh, who is a researcher at the U.S. and Canadian Studies Institute here in Moscow. Dr. Trush. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mark, for your presentation. Um, uh, United States still are one of the key element in the structure that you are being uh, that, that was focused in your presentation and we are witnessing the uh, election year in the states um, my question is uh, what is your understanding what is your reading of uh, the evolution the united states is going on uh, in the more long term um, perspective. Um, <clears throat> what do you think that uh, whatever the outcome of the election will be, uh, there will be a real uh, change of strategy, foreign policy strategy, the geopolitical worldview of the states, given that the uh, United States is uh, is very, very divided country. It is uh, lacking the general political consensus and and uh, all these four years that were trump administration was trying to impose its own world view uh, it was the years of battle uh, do you foresee the uh, new phase of this battle uh, if the democrats will 
uh, will come to power? And what is your understanding of the future uh, foreign policy strategy of United States in the new uh, four-year uh, period? Thank you. Okay, well, it's 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 a good question. It's impossible to answer in in a accurate way, obviously. But but I think one thing to say at the outset is we can't assume that Donald Trump is going to lose the next election. Uh, we can't even assume, I mean, this is me being a little bit paranoid perhaps, but uh, we can't even assume that the election won't be postponed if the coronavirus is still uh, killing people in large numbers in the United States and there's a demand that things have to be locked down and it's emergency circumstances and we can't really have a, an election at this moment. So, I mean, that might sound a little bit paranoid, but I'm not the only one beginning to think along these kinds of lines these days. That the, and one of the striking things about this particular uh, pandemic is that authoritarian rulers everywhere are taking advantage to clamp down, to uh, enact policies uh, that they would have been uh, reluctant to or found difficult to under other circumstances, which now under the cloak of this is a national health emergency, uh, the normal rules don't apply, then the normal rules don't apply. But anyway, let's assume that the election goes ahead uh, and that uh, Donald Trump loses. Uh, and I think a lot of people hope that might be the case. Uh, but it's, it's, this, the, I think the big point to make about this is that even if Joe Biden wins, I don't think that uh, it'll ever go back to being business as usual. This is the kind of hope or expectation that a lot of people have, I think, about uh, Biden presidency, that the old liberal international rules-based order will suddenly re-emerge and we'll all go back to being the way that we were. I think this pandemic, however long it lasts, is going to really change the way people think about the benefits of globalization, interdependence, uh, national vulnerability, uh, reliability of allies in particular sorts of circumstances, and the other major structural long-term changes that the basic dynamics between China and the United States are, I would guess, uh, unlikely to change. And that is China is going to continue rising, all other things being equal, and the United States is going to continue declining relatively uh, to China. So the realists have got a point to make about the importance of material power uh, and long-term structural changes in the international system. I mean, I think the big question is whether that kind of uh, change in the structural underpinnings can be managed peacefully or not. And the complicating factor that we haven't mentioned at all uh, in all of this is I'm a big, uh, as Alexander mentioned, one of my recent books is on uh, climate change. And I think this is the still much more so than coronavirus because that is going to go away uh, at some stage if the historical record is anything to go by. Climate change isn't. It might not be quite as immediate or quite as rapid. Uh, as uh, the coronavirus, of course, but it's going to have a huge impact on the way that we organize economic uh, and indeed international relations. So that's something that we've got to wrestle with and think about. And some of the assumptions, some of the models, some of the economic practices that we take for granted at the moment may simply be unsustainable in the future. And quite how that will play out is anybody's uh, guess. But I think it's not unreasonable to assume that for a whole variety of reasons, the world in the future is not going to look as it did in what some people think is that idyllic period of uh, American hegemony when at least some parts of the world were doing okay and seemed reasonably secure, even if we forget about all of the work, bits of the world in the developing world that never have been doing terribly well and are going to do even worse under uh, the coronavirus and and climate change. I hope that doesn't sound too pessimistic, but I think there is a lot to fret about. And part of it is about how America responds to being possibly the, not the most important country in the world and just one country amongst others. That's not going to be an easy thing for the American population to get their heads around, I don't think. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, I have Olga Puzanova, who is a researcher at our laboratory and an expert on Japan and whom you have met in Moscow, actually. I have. Olga. Yeah, where are you? Here, oh, just here. Hello, Olga. Hello, hi, nice to see you. Thank you so much for the talk. 
Um, so apologies to anyone who's um, tired of all the corona related stuff, but since you brought it up, um, I was wondering, so with all the um, recent uh, developments, we heard that um, Japan is funding the firms to shift production out of China and so forth. And do you think that with this in mind, there's further potential for economic convergence between Japan and Australia? Thank you so much. Okay, uh, just by the by, Olga's got the best English accent I've ever heard outside of uh, anybody in England. She's got a better English accent than me, it's quite astounding, but anyway, there you go. So, uh, but uh, always good to hear your voice, Olga. The question about uh, Japan and China is an interesting one. And one of the things about uh, economic interdependence is there are limits to it. Now, Japan and China had a very deep, important, a seemingly mutually beneficial economic relationship between them and you would think this would have had a transformative impact on relations between the two countries in reality as you would know it hasn't i mean i think it's not unreasonable to characterize characterize a relationship as a bit frosty and not ideal at the best of times it's simply i mean they're still trying to get over the second world war and uh, which is not a good look it seems to me so there's a lot of history there and economic interdependence hasn't been uh, able to kind of fix that or rectify it or have the pacifying impact that a lot of people thought it that it hoped it would or that it might so i've been surprised in some ways that there hasn't been a greater retreat of japanese multinationals from china even before the coronavirus and i think there had been i mean i've read some stuff about them shifting uh from china to india to try and get the same kinds of things happening and the same kinds of uh economic advantages uh, you would think that this might be another reason to think uh, carefully about the benefits of uh, having investments in countries that don't particularly like them and maybe are sources of threats that they hadn't even considered before. So I think this, this uh, tendency of investing at home rather than away might increase. But you're, you, you know, it's a good point about... Um, the relationship between Japan and Australia, because Japan used to be our biggest trading partner and source of investment, then China took over. But even at the heyday of uh, Japan's uh, most uh, prominent place in Australian economic affairs, there was a bit of facility and some tension about the relationship and not everybody in Australia was happy because this was 30 or 30 or 40 years ago now i suppose but there were still memories of the war and those kinds of things i think all of that in australia is no longer a problem or no longer an issue partly because australia is just about an asian country in every sense these days so uh, so those kinds of problems have gone away but you're right given that the the uh strategic relationship is important maybe the economic uh relationship will prosper as well however do you remember that Australia is buying uh, a new fleet of submarines and I and lots of other people thought they would buy them from Japan and for some reason best known to whoever made the deal they're buying them from France and despite the fact that France has never built them and despite the fact that the plans for their secret submarine appeared on the internet a couple of days later but still seemed like a good deal to many people in Canberra. Interesting thank you so much. Uh, uh, thank you. Mark, uh, well, there are some people who write that you should repeat something like a title of a book or something like that, but uh, you don't have to actually because uh, we are going to, we are actually making a recording. Of course, it's not only us, I think, but we, do, we are doing it officially. So, and we are going to put it on our website so anybody can listen to it again and uh, find what the inf whatever information they they want. Uh, so let me ask, let me ask myself, uh, use my as we say in Russia, administrative resource to ask a question. Uh, well, uh, we see now here that uh, Australia is very tough on China's influence, uh, and it's probably almost as tough as the United States in taking various measures in what they see in Australia as China's interference in politics, economics, and even education, uh, universe, works, uh, well, how, how the university works. 
uh, and uh, we are interested in Russia because we are also beginning to experience something like maybe maybe not to that extent. So the question is, you know, to 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 what extent this is exaggerated and uh, used by politicians to. Uh, you know, who don't like China, as you, uh, as you said, for various reasons, and to what extent this uh, this interference is is uh, real? Maybe you can even feel in your university or some other universities. Well, uh, at my university, we have a, a Confucius Institute, and quite a few. Uh, of the Australian universities also have them. And I think to be fair, it kind of depends who is running the Confucian Institutes in different, in different uh, states and universities, because some of them clearly are much closer to uh, the PRC leadership and much more willing to sort of, sort of toe the party line or to put a pro-China view uh, than others. But I've spoken at our Confucius Institute a couple of times, and I give my kind of standard line about the region and uh, concerns about China and uh, haven't been banned or locked up or so. I mean, I think it kind of depends on what's going on. But the more general question about is China trying to influence what goes on in uh, Australia? Sure. I mean, all countries. I'm sure Russia's trying to influence what goes on in Australia as well. And vice versa. I mean, this is what countries often do. They try to exert their influence and uh, shape the debate in their favour. So there's nothing surprising or uh, unusual about this in many ways. I think the, the interesting and the concerning thing for many Australian observers is that China is much better at it than most people and their influence is much more pervasive uh, than it is for most people. Uh, for example, as a prominent member of the Australian Senate had to uh, resign a couple of years ago because he accepted money from a prominent Chinese business person uh, and this was a big scandal. And so from that point forward, I think Australian policymakers and politicians have been quite careful uh, not to be seen to be kowtowing to China too avidly and certainly not uh, caught receiving uh, gifts or money or incentives from uh, Chinese uh, business people or anybody else for that matter. And it's interesting that uh, there's quite a bit of monitoring goes on of the kind of connections that exist between Australian higher education institutions and uh, those uh, in China. At one level, this is relatively benign, I think, because we're, except for the fact that we've discovered that relying too heavily on Chinese students uh, is a source of vulnerability for us, of course, when there's a pandemic. Sydney University, for example, 30% of their undergraduate students are from China. And now, surprise, surprise, they're experiencing a major financial crisis, despite being one of the most prominent universities in the country, and who should be in a pretty good position uh, in the kind of university marketplace. But they're very highly exposed. The other point that people have made is that maybe some of the Chinese students uh, have a kind of part-time job keeping an eye on other Chinese students and pushing a kind of pro-China line. And there was a revealing uh, episode at the University of Queensland a few months ago where uh, mainland students got into a uh, a fight with students from Hong Kong at the height of the demonstrations for a more independent Hong Kong uh, a few months ago. So those kinds of things are kind of spilling over into uh, Australian public life to some extent. And there's a famous or infamous book that you may or may not have heard about, written by Clive Hamilton, a prominent Australian academic called Silent Invasion, which uh, details some of the, according to him, many sources of Chinese influence uh, in Australian public life and uh, in ways that he thinks are seriously undermining Australia's national interests, capacity for independent action and uh, a whole variety of other possible threats. So in sum, it kind of depends uh, which bit of the relationship you're talking about, who you're talking to, what their central kinds of concerns are. But for the Australian strategic community, 
They're still primarily focused on China as a long-term strategic threat. For some of the business and economic community who are heavily reliant on China as their principal export market, they have a very different view and they think we should be downplaying some of the criticism uh, and concentrating on uh, the reason that Australia has gone for whatever it's 25 years now without having an economic recession. That record is about to burst, but for a long time, uh, first Japan, then China over the last 10, 15 years, have been responsible for a pretty formidable rise in Australian living standards. And some people think that's a lot to jeopardize uh, by overly being overly concerned about China's strategic threat. So it depends who you ask and what the focus of attention is, I think. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we have now people who want to ask questions for the, for the second time. What do you think? Shall we allow them to do that? You're no. the boss. <laughs> well, if you are not in a hurry, well, Professor Kanaev wants to ask another question. Okay. Uh, Mark, thank you very much again for your insightful remarks and answers. Uh, and uh, let's turn back to the Indo-Pacific narrative. Well, what really uh, makes me surprised is the New Zealand fact. Uh, some time ago, New Zealand said, uh, uh, New Zealand's officials said that uh, this idea didn't resonate well in New Zealand. But since recently, well, uh, Winston Peter, Jacinda Arden, and also on Mark uh, started to use uh, more, uh, uh, more and more often that term the Indo-Pacific region and uh, this is uh, what seems strange in many respects. Uh, first of all New Zealand has been successful in its policy, uh, the Pacific Reset policy and uh, in case New Zealand raises, uh, well speaks about its uh, readiness to embrace the Indo-Pacific term, the Indo-Pacific narrative uh, is, in your opinion, in New Zealand ready to join the quadrilateral defense cooperation as well as other formal and informal arrangements associated with the Indo-Pacific region? And what is the key reason for this, uh, for this usage of this uh, term? Is New Zealand ready to change its uh, Pacific focus, South Pacific focus, focus to embrace a wider geopolitical territorial domain? What is your opinion about it? Okay, that's a good question. I'm not an expert on New Zealand po uh, strategic policy, but I can make a couple of observations that you might find of interest. One is that uh, New Zealand's done some of the things that, in my opinion, and this is a very minority opinion in Australia, and almost nobody agrees with me, but in my opinion, we should be more like New Zealand uh, than we are, in the sense that New Zealand's made a judgment that they're, you know, country of whatever it is, five million people, they have a lot of money. So they've given up basically having a self-defense force because they can't afford one uh, and, and because nobody is threatening to invade New Zealand. So they've given up having a self-defense force, nobody's invaded, surprise, surprise. Now, in my view, particularly because uh, the Americans are going to decide any outcome in our part of the world, Australia could very well uh, give up some of the extraordinary expensive purchases on submarines and uh, fighter aircraft that they're thinking of making in the future and spend that on retrofitting the economy along green lines, paying for the coronavirus epidemic. There's a lot of other things you could do with that money that would be much more useful and much more beneficial for our quote unquote security, depending on how you want to define it. So that's one point uh, I would make. The other point about New Zealand though, is that they're not a member of ANZUS anymore. So in some ways they don't have the same need or strategic commitment that Australia has uh, to go along with whatever it is that the United States might think is a good idea at a particular time. So part of the rationale for Australia championing the Indo-Pacific was to try to encourage uh, the Americans to recommit to this part of the world in a way that Australia thinks is really important. But I think Australia, that New Zealand possibly doesn't because they've managed to live without the guarantee of the ANZUS treaty for whatever it is, 30 odd years now, and nothing's happened to them. Nobody's invaded, the sky hasn't fallen in, they're still secure, and they're probably more secure than they've ever been. So, uh, which is, you know, a kind of an interesting kind of thing to think about in these kinds of terms. But, but I don't, to be honest, I don't know exactly what uh, strategic thinking 
is in New Zealand on the Indo-Pacific, but I shall have to find out because it's clearly a gap in my knowledge. Right. Well, as Jones wanted to ask uh, a, a question <laughs> on internal politics, but I think, I think the answer that. is pretty clear, but, <laughs> but anyway, go ahead, please. Oh, sorry. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, yeah. My question was, um, will conservatives here and just like here inflate fears of Chinese d influence for political, domestic political gain? Are they doing that already? Yeah, well, this is, this is, this is probably a, a, a sort of question that's exclusively of, of interest to Australians. But, uh, but yes, I mean, some of the usual suspects uh, are always going to say, oh, China bad, America good. That's the kind of standard discourse we get in Australia. Uh, and it's understandable from an historical perspective. But, uh, but when we think about what's actually going on in the United States now, I think giving Donald Trump a blank check for whatever he thinks is a good idea uh, at that particular moment in time, which might change completely the next day, it's not a good uh, long-term way of thinking about the security of the country or its long-term strategic interests, it seems to me. So yes, people will undoubtedly have uh, a heated debate about what should or shouldn't be done in Australia, except revealingly in strategic circles in Canberra, which seem to be almost entirely immune to any sort of criticism or any sort of internal uh, debate, uh, much less a public debate, about the merits of various policy positions. And that may be an exclusively Australian problem, but it's kind of revealing that some forms of public policy discourse, I'm guessing it might be the same in Russia as well, but some forms of public policy discourse seem to be immune from widespread uh, comment, criticism, uh, or debate, uh, no matter how questionable some of the assumptions that inform them may be, or in Australia's case, how expensive uh, some of the costs of actually fulfilling or following through on those uh, kinds of things may be. And uh, as I said, I'm in a very small minority who thinks we ought to have a pretty serious rethink about some of our strategic priorities, but nobody takes a great deal of interest of anything I, I say, except it seems for 34 people on a Zoom conference in the middle of the night, which is quite encouraging. Right, thanks. Ilya Alenikov wants to ask a question, and I think it's the last one. At least I don't have any other questions here. Ilya, are you here? Yes, yes. Uh, thank you for uh, your lecture. And the question is, uh, what are the prospects for free trade agreements uh, between China, uh, Australia, and New Zealand? And uh, how uh, Australia and New Zealand uh, respond to China's increased economic and political activity in Oceania? In, in activity in? in Oceania or... Ocean, Oceania, okay, the Pacific. Yes, okay, good question. So as far as I'm aware, uh, Australia, I think I'm right in saying this, Australia and New Zealand both have free trade agreements with China already. So that's kind of a done deal. And everybody was very pleased about that, given the importance of China as a major trade partner. But you're right to uh, highlight the uh, importance of the Pacific, because it's interesting that uh, normally... Uh, New Zealand and uh, even uh, and, and Australia take a sort of slightly patronizing view of the Pacific Islands that they're kind of our uh, neighbors and we look after them and they they need our help to survive and and in some ways some of this might be true but uh, but it's interesting that we usually kind of ignore them and don't pay them too much attention but once China started to uh, pay a bit of attention to some of the Pacific Island countries and there was talk about China possibly building a naval base in, uh, I'm not sure if it was, uh, where was it, Fiji or Tonga? I can't remember. Anyway, they were talking about building a, a naval base somewhere in the Pacific. And all of a sudden, Australia got very excited about this. And Scott Morrison paid a visit to the Pacific Islands and uh, tried to reassure all of our neighbors in the Pacific that we were really supportive of them and had their interests at heart. And the Pacific leaders uh, pointed out that if Australia really was so concerned 
about their future. Why didn't they do something about climate change? Why didn't they stop being the world's biggest exporter of coal uh, and actually do something that would actually benefit uh, them in the long term? Because the future of the Pacific Islands is not good. Uh, they are going to, quite a few of them, disappear beneath the waves. And then the big question then will be, you know, how concerned are we about our quote unquote Pacific family? Are we willing to accept possibly hundreds of thousands of climate change refugees from the Pacific? Or will we take the kind of fairly uh, inward looking, hard nosed attitude to refugees that we have done from other parts in the world and told them to go home again or turn them around if they try to get here by boat? So the future uh, of some of these problems is potentially quite grim and it will be a major test of Australia's humanitarian, diplomatic and strategic priorities and which takes precedence over which. And I've got a pretty shrewd idea which is likely to be. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, well, another question is, has appeared. You that Russian. The last one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that, were, that one was the last Russian one. No, not, not, not Russian because it's coming from Russia, but Russian sends the Russian idea of the last one. <laughs> so Aksana Pugacho wants to ask you about something about Europe and the United Kingdom. I guess you can answer that because you are also British, not, not, not only Australian. <laughs> Indeed. Now, this, this could be, unfortunately, this could be the beginning of a very, very long answer because uh, I won't, but uh, I'm tempted to because I think that Brexit has been a disaster for Britain, which they will, which will become increasingly apparent as time goes on. And I think that the European Union, I may be the only person in Australia that thinks this, but I think the European Union, I tell this to students, is the greatest political experiment in the history of the world, bar none. Uh, and if it collapses, if it falls over, if it is seen to be not able to continue to do some of the things that it's done in the past, which is possible, then it will be a disaster, not just for Europe, but for the world, because we don't have any good examples, or hardly any, good examples of long-term institutionalized patterns of cooperation that have actually done some good, not just for the economy, but Europe, as you would know, living in that part of the world, has been at peace for, what, 50, 60 years now, and it's no coincidence that the European Union has been at the center of that. So if the European Union didn't do anything else, it brought peace to Europe. And we all know about Europe's history, what it looks like. So that's no small achievement. So if it doesn't do anything else, that's been a big plus. So I'm a big fan. And I think that populism in Britain, Boris Johnson's premiership are disasters. Uh, and they will live to rue the day, in my view. So it uh, gives me no pleasure to say so, but long live the European Union, is my view. Well, we in this country know a lot about collapsing great uh, political <laughs> projects. <laughs> Didn't like to say anything. <laughs> so welcome to the family. But this was, not, uh, <laughs> this was not the question yet. Oksana, do you want to ask your question? Oksana? Uh, hello. Gone off and a half. Alex, oh. uh, Mr. Thank you very much for your uh, speech, Professor Bisson. My question is, uh, what is the uh, European country's attitude toward uh, the concept of the Indo-Pacific uh, region, uh, in particular the United Kingdom's one? And uh, can we expect the United uh, Kingdom's uh, increase in engagement in the region after it has left uh, the European Union? Thank you. Well, I think the answer to the, sh the second part is uh, no. I think one of the things about Britain, it's, uh, it's, it's, it gives me no, no pleasure to say this, but it's a bit embarrassing in a way that I think the British generally have yet to come to terms with the fact that they're not a global hegemon, they don't have an empire, that nobody else takes them terribly seriously, that they're a kind of middle power, basically, with delusions of grandeur. And I think that's a lot of the reason for Britain's behaviour generally, uh, and these ideas about it suddenly carving out a new identity and niche in the world and engaging as a dynamic global trader, 
I think it's a lot of baloney personally, and it's wishful thinking. And to be more specific about Britain and the Indo-Pacific and Europe and the Indo-Pacific, I'd be quite surprised if, apart from a few people like the people in this gathering tonight and a few specialists in universities around you, I would guess that if you ask the ordinary person in the street, what's the Indo-Pacific, they would look at you blankly and not have the faintest idea. I'm just guessing that the Indo-Pacific is not a hot to debating uh, point in, in most places in Europe at the moment. So I'd be surprised if it's had much impact at all. As for Britain having any impact on that, I would think uh, next to none, basically. I think the interesting thing to watch as a test of all this will be, uh, I'm assuming as you uh, know something about this, you've probably heard of ASEM, the Asia Europe, Europe Summit, that, uh, or meeting, I should say. Are you, are you familiar with ASEM? Yep. Okay, so that was heralded as the big connection between Europe uh, and uh, Asia. In reality, uh, I mean, it's just been a big uh, talk fest, junket. It's great if you get invited because you get all expenses, or used to before coronavirus, all expenses trip to wherever they're having the latest ASEM meeting and to hang out with your friends and have a good time. But in terms of actually doing anything, changing the dynamic, making any impact on anybody's foreign policy, uh, I think the evidence is a little bit thin. But that might just be me speaking as somebody who's never been invited to take part and never been invited on one of these big junkets, but, uh, but there you are. Mm -hmm. Did this guy, the defense minister, who wanted to send two warships to the Indo-Pacific and then he found out that they've not been built yet? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Small flaw in the plan, but other than that... <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, anyway, well, thank you very much. We don't have any questions, any more questions, and thank you very much for your great talk. And we hope to see you uh, or via Skype, for for example, or Zoom, or any other, or maybe even if well, if In they person. let us, if, if if they let us go out <laughs> at some Indeed. point, Indeed. <laughs> maybe even in person. Yeah, I, I also locked at home at the moment in Australia. Yeah, everybody is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because in some countries they are not, like in Sweden or somewhere, but. Yeah, but we are not we are only allowed to go to the local shop and that's it. Yeah, okay. it's the same here. Yeah. Right. Well, well thanks thank very much for the invitation. And th thanks for all the great questions as well. Yeah. I appreciate thank that. You. So. Right. Bye bye. Well, thank you very much. Okay, bye bye, bye, -bye. Thank you very much. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Nice to talk to you all.